Thank you, um, thank you, Sean, for inviting me, giving me an opportunity to be here um, uh, for, for those th these two days. Um, I have primarily come to um, uh, to learn, not only to learn more about human rights and the human rights framework, but also to learn about the other debates, the other policy developments in the area of intellectual property. Um, I think for the first time when I, heard, when, I, when I saw IP and human rights clash very visibly was about 13, 14 years ago, I was at a meeting in Geneva about access to HIV medicines where someone made a passionate, um, uh, passionate plea for, for access to HIV uh, medications stating that uh, those access to those medicines was uh, was a human rights. And one of the pharmaceutical company executives who was present at that meeting jumped up and said, this is a ridiculous notion. What is next? The right to food? Um, <laughs> and um, that, that's where we were 14 years ago. So this is also to say uh, two things. Um, I, I know a little bit more about human rights than he did at the time, but also a lot, uh, a lot has changed. Um, there is, of course, a tension, obviously. Uh, access to safe, effective medicines are the essential components of the fulfillment of the right to health. I think it's important to pay attention to the aspects of safe and effective, because you also, you also see sort of abuse, including by the pharmaceutical industries, when it is, uh, when it is in their interest to use the rights framework to obtain access or, for example, to force payments for medicines that actually in terms of efficacy or safety would not, would not deserve that. So to look at this also from a health perspective is incredibly important. Now, access to medicines requires state action and the world, work of the, the world Health Organization has done a lot of work in determining what, what it is, what countries should do, what countries should put in place, what a good medicines, national medicines policy uh, looks like. And it is the government's responsibility to uh, ensure the selection of essential medicines. You said the WHO essential medicines list is a model list, but the ultimate determination of what you regard as an essential medicine in your country is the role and the responsibility of government. Quality insurance is another a very important state um, responsibility. Procurement and supply and of course rational use, making sure that medicines that are available are also used, uh, used properly. Now, on the other hand, the development and the production of medicines is largely left to the commercial private sector. So this decisions on which drugs will be developed, which drugs will, will not be developed, um, where they will be brought to market and to what price is largely uh, decisions that are made by, um, by, by private commercial companies. And this, of course, leads to tension and it leads, as we've seen, to rationing or non-availability if medicines are priced out of reach of, of people's and communities' ability to pay, and in some cases it leads to drugs not being available at all simply because they are not developed. Now, trade agreements and, um, and access to medicines. If you look at the development of international guidance and international uh, policies with regard to medicines that sort of started in the mid-70s. The first WHO essential medicines list was published in 1977. That was followed by the development of the WHO revised drug strategy, very much influenced by the Alma-Ata, the Health for All uh, declaration. In those days it was the health for all and not just we'll do a little bit for three diseases, which is very much the framework we're in. Uh, we're in today, and the notion of human rights was very influential in the development of these policies. So that all happened within the UN, but at the very same time, the developments, of course, took place to establish the World Trade Organization. That happened in '95, where the WTO TRIPS agreement came into force, and those two policy developments took place entirely divorced. There was, no, there was no connection be, uh, be, between that. Um, Pre-trips, as Sean already um, described earlier, 
uh, patenting practices and requirements in countries were very dif different. Countries also used the concept of essential medicines in their decision to determine whether products could be patentable or not. For example, the Andean region excluded all essential medicines from patentability. So those, those are the kinds of policy spaces and policy options that were lost uh, with the implementation of the WTO and uh, TRIPS agreement. Now, the, 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 the shift back, the sort of the, the big rebalancing act that happened in the uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s, was very much driven uh, by the HIV AIDS access crisis that provoked international action and in particular at the WTO an international rethinking of um, uh, in particular the effects of, of the TRIPS agreement which led to the Doha declaration on TRIPS and public health which I think is a very powerful instrument that should be used much more uh, broadly and I'll come back to that, uh, come back to that later. Um, well, while preparing for this meeting here today, um, I, learned, uh, I learned a number of, of new things, and I think this quote from um, Amartya Sen, did I misspell his name? I think I did. Um, <laughs> I apologize. The richness of practice is also critically relevant for understanding the concept and reach of human rights. I think this is a very polite way of saying um, they're, um, they're, they're meaningful as long as you can actually enforce them. And what is, what is interesting is that in, um, in the late 2000s, a lot of individuals and organizations used the human rights framework and human rights provisions in constitutions there where they existed to uh, gain access to essential medicines, in particular in the area of HIV AIDS. And that went well beyond the um, access to the medicines for the individual. They also used it as a way to change the policies of the countries. And that has been uh, very, um, in, in a number of countries, very, very effective, in particular in, um, in, in Latin America. Um, I won't go through the 47 human rights guidelines. Suri gave an, an excellent um, an excellent introduction to that, but I just wanted to draw attention to the guidelines with regard to patents and licensing, because that is, of course, part of the background of what I was actually supposed to be talking about this morning, and that is the medicines, uh, that is the medicines patent pool. The notion that while patents exist, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, restrictions to access or rationing or non-availability. Uh, patents are not uh, God-given uh, God -given rights, uh, they're policy tools, and if they cause harm, you need, to, uh, you need to intervene. You can also put mechanisms in place to make sure that the harm is, is reduced as much as possible. That is where the medicines patent pool comes in. The medicines patent pool, which was established by Unitate, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the history in, the middle, in, in a minute, what it does is it negotiates patent licenses from those that hold the, patent license, the patents on HIV med medications. Those are mostly pharmaceutical companies, but not exclusively. Um, the NIH here around the corner, for example, is, is one of the uh, licensors to the medicines patent pool. And then licenses those out to others, such as generic manufacturers that need access to that intellectual property. Um, the medicines patent pool was not established in a vacuum. I already referred to the, uh, the guidelines of the, the special rapporteur. There's also the WHO Global Strategy and Plan of Action that in 2008 uh, signaled this can be a promising way out, but we need to do a feasibility study, something that Unitate took up and concluded that this was indeed the way to go and <clears throat> subsequently took the decision to... Um, established the medicines patent pool. The medicines patent pool is now an integral part of the WHO HIV strategy. So it has become, through this sort of norm setting in these various fora, it now has become an international mechanism that, um, that, that exists. It continues to be supported by, um, by Unitaid for at least another, uh, another four years. And it was, of course, established in a response to this. I don't know how many of you have heard that uh, HIV uh, medicines 
are not patented or that patents in developing countries do not exist. This crowd is probably too, too educated to, uh, to, to be told such lies or to believe them. But in the general public, this is something that is still very much uh, widespread belief. There's a lot of belief in, uh, in, in these discussions. But this, is, this, is the, this shows you the patenting practices of pharmaceutical companies with regard to HIV medicines before 95 in developing countries and this is what it looks like uh, looks like today there is has been an, an enormous increase both in numbers and in countries where pharmaceutical companies seek uh, seek patents and that includes uh, sub-saharan african uh, countries as well so um, of course if patent licenses are available from the medicines patent pool, these patents do not necessarily have to be um, have to be a barrier. So, <clears throat> what are the advantage, advantages of the pool? First of all, it negotiates licenses from a public health perspective, which is quite different from two companies negotiating a license, because the patent pool pays attention to a, a, a number of of terms and conditions that, for example, a generic company would not necessarily. Uh, prioritized. To give you one example, um, the ability to um, provide a country that has issued a compulsory license with the product that is produced under a license from the medicines patent pool is an important provision that the medicines patent pool would push and has also managed to uh, obtain from uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies. Um, transparent, transparency is, is a key feature. The licenses of the medicines patent pool are publicly available for anyone to look at or to comment on. Um, that is not the case of uh, license agreements between, uh, between companies. They're predictable. It is very clear to go to the patent pool website. Um, it is obvious for anyone who, uh, who wants to decide whether they want to start negotiations or not, what the patent pool is actually after, after to get. Um, it isn't only a matter of obtaining patents. The pool is very active in making sure that the licenses are licensed out to companies that have the ability and have the, the, the capacity to produce products um, of, a, of a short quality. So there's a very proactive relationship with generic manufacturers. It also works together with the World Health Organization to make sure that the right kinds of formulations, preferably in fixed dose combinations, are developed. Because that is, of course, an HIV treatment um, key. Uh, as much as possible, these treatments should go to market in fixed dose combinations for, for, for various reasons. I mentioned quality insurance. There's very close collaboration with the World Health Organization's pre-qualification program. Very key um, a priority for the pool. And Unitate as a strategic partner. Unitate is an important financer of the creation of markets uh, for these medicines and plays a role there where the market needs a bit of priming or needs a bit of uh, needs a bit of help to get off the off the ground. Um, there are also very important limitations to the medicines patent pool. The first is, and very analogous to, to the various human rights uh, guidelines that Suri, Suri uh, discussed uh, earlier, participation is voluntary. This was a very strong ask from the companies when the WHO, for example, <coughs> or the World Health Assembly negotiated the, the Global Strategy and Plan of Action. They could endorse recommendations on a medicines patent pool as long as it was voluntary. But that also means that they voluntarily can decide to not collaborate with it. Um, and that is a weakness. There are very, um, there, there are limited mechanisms to force companies to come to the negotiating table if they don't want to. Also, the pool is not really in a position, um, although it has an absolutely incredible negotiating team, but it isn't really in a position to dictate um, terms and conditions. And um, important to recognize, it is limited to HIV. And here I, I want to mention, in the broad, make a broader point, because often when we talk about access to medicines and progress that has been made in access to medicines, what we're really talking about is changes and progress in access to treatment for HIV. Perhaps a little bit in malaria, not a great deal in TB. And often the world is left with 
the impression that there is enormous progress in access to medicines, but we're really talking about access to medicines in one specific disease area, which is huge, needs are huge, the achievements have been enormous and it is fantastic, but it raises questions for what can we learn from that? Um, can we roll things over into other diseases or are we finding ourselves in a situation where um, the key players, including the companies, are willing to do something for HIV, but please don't come and ask us for anything else. And I think that that is something to keep very much in, uh, in mind in, in these discussions. So in conclusion, was this for me or was this still two no, no, no. minutes? <laughs> um, where am I actually? You have five minutes. I have five, five minutes. Oh, God. I five minutes for this. In, con in conclusion, um, the medicines patent pool is an important mechanism to ensure access to HIV medicines, uh, which of course is an essential component of the fulfillment of people's right to health. Um, the pool also has some limitations, and in particular, as I discussed earlier, when medicines patent holders refuse to license their patents under public health ranking terms and conditions, trade, um, IP, competition law, hand in hand with the human rights framework, offer powerful tools for governments to intervene. I fully agree with Suri when she says um, these actually are government's responsibilities. And it's the same with licensing. If companies do not want to come to the table voluntarily and their refusal to license, their refusal to, 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 to negotiate um, leads to um, uh, access problems, it is a government's obligation to step in and make sure that the licenses by other means are made, made available, and there we do not need new mechanisms for that. There are, uh, the legal framework for that to happen um, exists. Um, that could also be a powerful tool for citizens to demand government's action, including through courts or, for example, competition authorities, such as um, the, in, uh, uh, along the way of, of the activists in South Africa have done a few, a few years ago. Uh, you could argue that the refusal to license on reasonable terms strengthens uh, the case for compulsory licensing. Um, but again, that will require a go government action. So ultimately, the access to essential medicines as a key component of the fulfillment of the right to health depends on the willingness of governments to act. And this should also include uh, government's willingness to explore access-friendly ways to finance, research, and development. That is another half-hour presentation. But um, in order to find sustainable solutions to this tension of having research and development primarily financed through patent rents um, leads to all kinds of, of, of undesirable societal um, and health effects, which could be remedied if we would have uh, a different approach to financing the research, uh, research and development and delinking paying for the R&D from the price of the product. But as I said, that's entirely, that's, 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 not, that's another presentation, but it okay. is part, it, in, in, in my mind, it is very much part of, um, of, of the future and of finding sustainable solutions to the problems we will otherwise continue to run into. <coughs>